If somebody asks to be paid to be on your board of directors, I want you to run away. Like. Hey there, I'm Dan Martell, serial entrepreneur, investor, and creator of SaaS Academy. In this episode, I'm gonna share with you how to assemble a board of directors that is productive and supports you as the CEO. And be sure to stay till the end. We're gonna tell you how to get access to my Dream 100 framework. That is a uh, process for building kind of a network to support you in all your dreams. It's what I do. Every time I start a new company, I build the same 100 people list. It takes me a while to curate, but if you do it, literally, your success will be guaranteed. So be sure to stay at the end for that, but let's get into it. So boards, boards, boards. Here's the crazy part is um, I do not like sitting on boards of directors. Um, I do it, I'm gonna share a little bit about that, but I personally think, and I heard this from Richard Branson, I had the privilege of spending a week with him in Switzerland and I asked him um, how many boards he sits on because he has 400 companies and he said zero or very few. He may sit on a few nonprofit boards. The reason why he then said to me is boards are boring. You know, people kind of have all this process they go through. Um, and I honestly, for my experience has been the same. I think if you know how to run them right, which is not the topic of this conversation, but they can be fun. But here's the deal. I've been on boards. I've sat on nonprofit boards, like an accelerator called Propel ICT that was built by the community. Uh, I did that for two or three years. I've had my own boards for my last two venture back companies. So I had investors and co-founders uh, sit on that board. I currently sit on the board today of an incredible company called Pila Case or Pila. Pila is one of the top 10 fastest growing companies in Canada. They make an incredible phone case, which I will absolutely pimp out. Check out this, their new model. That's flaxseed, it's a biopolymer. Um, so go check out pila.earth if you wanna go check out their product lines. Um, but I've helped many of my coaching clients create the perfect board. Because if not, you will absolutely have uh, politics show up, you will have people that add no value and you will want to feel like every time you're gonna get an anxiety attack trying to deliver to the board meetings if you don't set them up right. So I'm gonna walk you through exactly how to think through them in these five strategies. Number one, fight for the biz. So rule number one for me, if you're gonna add people to your board of directors, they need to be there to represent the best interests of the business. They need to be there to support the shareholders and the corporation. Now, I know that you would love for them to be your friend and to, to say yes to everything you do, but the truth is, is if you ask somebody, because they're financially responsible for their advice, like essentially there's, you know, they're responsible for, there's a fiduciary responsibility to the corporation as a whole and the shareholders that trust them to help guide the CEO. I absolutely love actually the concept of a board where if somebody is the CEO, you need some oversight and you need separate people so there isn't one bad actor. I mean, if you're the founder today and you're putting together your own board of directors, I think that's, a, and you're not doing it because you have to, it's a very mature move to do uh, because it shows to the rest of the world, it's like, hey, I wanna hold myself to a higher standard. I'm willing to have people around me that are gonna challenge and provide guidance and, and fight for the best outcome for our customers and everybody else. And sometimes there's gonna be blind spots that I don't, ha that I don't see these, these opportunities and having people be able to bring those to my attention is a very mature thing and amazing. But just understand the board of directors, number one, they're fighting for the biz, not necessarily for you as the CEO. Number two, keep it small. So rule of thumb for most boards is you wanna have an odd number. The reason why is you need a tiebreaker. There's nothing worse than having some kind of motion, some decision that's just being delayed because you don't have an odd number of votes so that you can kind of keep business moving forward. At the end of the day, momentum is how we win in this game. I think the smaller, the better. Like when I look at my boards that I've created myself, three to five people, three in the early days, if you've raised kind of a series A funding, maybe C it, I think it could be a little early, um, but your series A, you might have an investor or two and a couple of co-founders or maybe just you and it's three. I mean, I would only allow one personally, one investor, you, and then pull in an independent, but um, three is a great number because then really you're just like kind of reviewing, you're running the business. Most, most board of directors, just so you know, they don't know enough context to be able to help you run the company, nor should you. I actually had a friend of mine, his first board meeting, he raised over $10 million for his company, Series A. First board meeting, he jumps in there, he lists a bunch of stuff in the PowerPoints. These are the things that I want your advice on. They go through the board meeting two hours later, they wrap up, 
They're finishing up. One of the board members pulls them aside and says, hey, just so you know, if you don't come into the board meeting with decisions and you just want our feedback on your decisions, we're gonna find somebody else who can run this company. And he was blown away. He was like, I thought I was doing the right thing. I was getting optionality. Here's some things I wanted their feedback. But the truth is, you know, people want you to run the company. So if you have three to five board members, come prepared, come ready to go. And they're just there to give you context, insights, help you see things a different way. But three to five is the perfect amount. If you have a lot more, then there's some weird dynamics or different dynamics I'm just not aware of that might be true for your circumstance if it's a nonprofit board or a family, you know, family business. But man, I seen some photos of some board, uh, board of director meetings with like 16 people. To me, I just feel like you're not gonna be able to actually do something meaningful and thoughtful. Try to keep it as small as you can. Number three, value adders. So there's this natural tendency to think of like, oh, I'm gonna have my lawyer be on my board of directors because then I'll get free legal advice. Probably the worst thing you could possibly do um, because they're not gonna give you advice and, and having them not add value. Like if you need a lawyer on your board, you could just pay somebody to be your lawyer. Like that's what I do. I have a ton of lawyers. I just pay them to solve problems, to set up stuff, but I do not need them in, you know, like lawyers are risk adverse, right? Accountants are the exact same way. But most people by default, they will have, let's say they're investors or other people. I like asking myself, who's somebody that's been to where I wanna go and how do I get them involved on my board, right? And I think, you know, that's a really powerful way to look at it and you don't wanna make sure you don't just have it a bunch of investors and you as, especially if you're a solo uh, founder and you know, you've raised a lot of money, you don't have a lot of control, you wanna make sure that you structure the board so that you have a little bit of influence. Yes, they're there to fight for the business, the corporation, the shareholders, but don't put yourself into a bad position through decisions or negotiations you can have up front. So yes, investors are gonna be there, that's usually the case, but try to keep it small, and then also bring in uh, your co-founder and other people that you trust to make it work. Number four, balance the board. So the balancing of the board for me is having an independent director on the board, uh, ideally uh, the tiebreaker. So on one of the boards I'm involved in, there's two investors, two co-founders, and I'm the independent. And my job there is not to just side with the, the founding team as a, as a blanket kind of yes man person. And I told him that, don't ask me to be on your board if you're expecting me to just say yes to everything you do. But I also know that like sometimes investors have a short-term horizon and entrepreneurs have a long-term horizon. And I'm trying to represent the best um, outcome for the shareholders over a long period of time. Being willing, again, that's my style, is being willing to be misunderstood by the market, making investments into the future, not into the quarter that are gonna be successful. So find an independent director that ideally shares your values, your approach to business that you don't feel would be easily swayed by your investors, but obviously there'll be influence so that you have some balance on your board of directors. Number five, equity, not cash. So the question always comes out, well, how much do I pay these people? You know, it sounds expensive. Well, here's the reality. If you have investors, you don't pay them anything. Yeah, you'll offer up to cover their expenses, but you're not gonna actually pay them. If somebody asks to be paid to be on your board of directors, I want you to run away. Like those people, the professional board member, that's not what I'm talking about. For most companies I coach, SaaS founders, technical founders, people that are building high growth companies, investors are gonna sit on the board. They don't require compensation, but you can cover their expenses uh, reasonably. So that's on that side. If you have independent directors, you wanna, you wanna use equity. And the way it usually works to think about it, and I got this from Brad Feld, um, incredible uh, person in the venture world, but Brad talks about like the equivalent of what a VP level would get compensated compensated in equity. So you can think about it kind of like 0.2% to maybe 1% and, and typically half of that, right? That'll be depending on the, the, the experience and the stature and the, um, the pedigree that person might bring, an independent board member or uh, et cetera. You want to use equity. You never want to, I mean, as a company, cash is king. You want to reinvest it in growth and you want to leverage equity to create more value as a pool so that's the way I think about compensating board members. Equity is always preferred over cash. Quick recap, number one, fight for the biz. That's the focus of the board of directors. Number two, keep it small. Number three, value adders only. Number four, balance the board. And number five, equity, not cash.
As I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I wanna share with you an exclusive resource called the Dream 100. It is the 100 contacts, the list of people I, I research and I put together, the 10 mentors, the 30 advisors, the 60 peers that are on this journey to support me and my business. Um, you can click the link below to get access to that training. It is how I've been able to start new companies, new projects, and get to traction as quickly as possible using the Dream 100 framework. So be sure to click the link to check that out. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my channel. Be sure to smash the like button and leave me a comment or share with somebody that you care about that you think it could serve. As per usual, I want to challenge you to live a bigger life and a bigger business, and I'll see you next Monday.